Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar uh, presented by Manufacturing Works and our support member on Technology Partners. Uh, will be presented by Ken Fanger, who's the president of On Technology Partners. Um, joining us on the call, will Samanth be joining us on the call, Ken? I don't know if he's come on. He was supposed to okay. come, but it's very possible that he got called away. Okay, we were hoping that Samanth uh, Maranpudu of the Cleveland Public Power will be joining us today as one of the customers of On Technology Partners. Today is part uh, of a three-part series that we're doing. This is the second part. Um, the first part was a lot of the fundamentals and basics. The third part will really be specific to uh, CMMC requirements, security maturity model certification for those people working with the Department of Defense, either as a supplier or as a direct contractor. Now this session here will really deal um, right in the middle. It's, it's really about uh, the focus on uh, your employees and uh, what they can do to help in, in, the, uh, in securing your network. Uh, a couple of house cleaning items. Uh, we will always monitor the chat box and please feel free to uh, just jump in at any time. We do encourage interruptions. So whether it be a chat or if you wanna just turn your camera on and ask a question, we wanna answer your questions. So we go through the presentation, but if you've got a question, feel free to fire it away. Uh, you can either chat directly to me or you can uh, chat to everyone, whichever method you prefer. Um, and then at the end of this uh, presentation, we are recording it, so we'll put it up on our YouTube channel for those people that uh, weren't able to watch the whole thing or listen to it all to be able to get back to it. Uh, quickly, Manufacturing Works, we're part of a group of uh, uh, 300 member organizations and about 1,100 other businesses in Northeast Ohio. Uh, we provide uh, services to this very large network of uh, manufacturers. And uh, our job here is to make sure we connect uh, our manufacturing members and entities with uh, support members that can help them with services. So we have a variety of services along those lines. Our sponsor for all of our technology related webinars is Team Neo and the Smart Manufacturing Cluster of Northeast Ohio of which we are a member and an active participant. And with that said, I'm gonna give the baton over to Rick Earls uh, so he can tell us, uh, he's the uh, um, Senior Director of Industry and Innovation at Team Neo, just to tell us a little bit more about uh, Team Neo and the Smart Manufacturing Cluster. Let me, let me start with uh, Team Neo first. Uh, again, uh, Team Neo is a private nonprofit economic development organization accelerating business growth and job creation through the 18 counties of the Northeast Ohio region. Uh, as the designated Jobs Ohio Network Partner, we align and amplify local economic development efforts in the region's 18 counties. We conduct research and data analysis to inform local conversations and influence solutions. We market the Northeast Ohio region and we work to increase access to jobs, education and training for the region's 4.3 million people. We do this to build a more vibrant regional economy, one that's more talented, equitable, competitive, innovative, resilient, and prosperous. Now, my <clears throat> the major role I have at Team Neo right now is to focus on the activities of the smart manufacturing cluster. So let me let me describe a little bit of what you can expect from the smart manufacturing cluster. Uh, the Smart Manufacturing Cluster of Northeast Ohio accelerates the growth and competitiveness of the Northeast Ohio economy through the implementation of smart manufacturing and innovation that leverages the region's rich manufacturing heritage, unique assets, and talented workforce. We lead the development of innovation roadmaps and serve as the platform for the region's manufacturing blueprint to accelerate adoption and maximize the value of technology. We connect knowledge, experience, tools, and networks with manufacturers to generate demand, increase productivity, spur product innovation, and develop the talent and resources necessary to drive technology implementation and innovation. So now if you're interested, you can call either myself or Erica um, if you have more questions about Team Neo. And um, with regards to smart manufacturing, um, if you would like, there's also a special tool called a data-driven manufacturing 
uh, <coughs> um, readiness assessment that you can take, which could help you start your journey, your transformation, digital transformation journey um, through a process that would uh, eventually gain you uh, some idea of what you need to, uh, to complete that journey successfully, start implementing technology, uh, also uh, be introduced to solution providers that can help you implement that, also introduce you to subject matter experts that can help you and even gain access to uh, the opportunities for funding, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, product, I'm sorry, the systems implementation, or in for that matter, even from training. So again, all of that is available to you. Just let us know, we'll help you uh, through that process. Good, uh, thank you, Rick. And if you give me a minute, I'll, I'll make sure that everyone has a link to their readiness assessment. I think it's a very good tool, a great place to start. Um, and then uh, let me go back. I'm going to go ahead and uh, give you all uh, uh, 30 seconds about Ken, a little background on Ken. So uh, local, uh, born and raised here in Northeast Ohio in the Lind Lindhurst area, um, 27 years with the On Technology Partners. Uh, they are a certified female business entity. Uh, they're a 15-year consultant. Uh, they can work with the Jumpstart from their inception and forward and a variety of other companies. So really good background. Uh, BS at uh, Miami University, uh, followed by an MBA at Michigan State with a uh, special, specializing in supply chain management. So he, he does understand some of the uh, issues and that uh, manufacturers here uh, uh, are having. So with that, I uh, will turn it over to you, Ken. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's start with something really fun. Uh, if you would take out your phones or your tablets, I wouldn't recommend doing this on the computer itself because the questions will show up, but we're going to do a introductory fun little quiz. So what I'd like you to do, I'm going to go over here, click on this and then share it. So you should see the, um, whoops, the pin number. So if you go to kahoot.it and then type in this pin and then put in your uh, whatever name you want. Okay. We're gonna have a few questions to get us kind of started on cybersecurity and your employees and kind of explain why you, uh, may want to think about this. Anyone else? Okay, good. Excellent. Anybody else gonna join? I think there might be one other person. Otherwise, we'll give it a count to five. Five, four, three, two, here we go. Okay, get ready for the first question. How many employees get, how do many employees get attacked? How do most employees get attacked? Drinking at a bar, website, spam, email, going to the groceries. How do you think most of your employees might get cyber attacked? That's right, spam and email is the number one way that we end up getting cyber attacked from ransomware to wire fraud. So good job, everybody. So I like drinking at the bar as a better solution. Okay, PT is leading us on this one, good job. Question number two, what is the average cost of a cyber attack in 2020? $25, $8,000, $200,000, $8.64 million. Waiting, I should be playing the uh, Jeopardy music here. Okay, it is $8.64 million. So it is a massive amount. Oh, Jeff's moving up. Okay, number three, what is one of the best ways an employee can protect your company? 
share her password with the whole office, have a strong, unique password, click on sketchy ads, nap instead of work. I'm a big fan of napping instead of work. Follows what my sons seem to do all the time. Okay, have a strong, unique password. That is exactly right. Uh, amazing, your password is your first line of defense. If you don't have it strong, it's really a problem. Okay, Joanne's moving up. Question number four. How do most wire, most wire fraud attacks happen? They send an email with a bank payment request. They break into the bank records. They dumpster dive for passwords. They cyber stalk the CEO. Yep, that's right. Most of them come with a request and email. And we'll talk about whaling, which is kind of having it come from your CEO as we go through this presentation. Okay, Jeff is on fire there. Look at him go. He's starting to move up. Last question, which is one of the best ways to protect your employees? Invest in automation, cybersecurity technology, punish anyone that does something wrong, create a culture of security through training, get rid of all of your employees. This is a trick question. We'll see what people get. Yep, I, good job, everyone. It is create a culture of security. Cyber automation protection is good, but if your employees aren't on board with it, they could accidentally or intentionally undermine it. We'll talk about that as we get into this. Okay, let's see. Becca is number three, good job. Number two, we've got PT. And number one is Shanti. Great job, everybody. Now let's bop back here to the presentation. Share that out. Okay, so now that was kind of fun, let's get back into, again, I wanna make sure that um, if you have questions as we go, this presentation is for you guys. So make sure that you ask them, put them in the chat, Ron is watching the chat or you know just share, because at the end of the day, the information should be what's relevant to you. I try to make this useful, but it's most useful if you share. So that being said, we're gonna talk about your employees, they're not your enemies, the threats that you face, what you can do to help protect, and then we'll do a quiz and you have a chance for $50. So I wanna start by saying the employees are not your enemies, but it's important to remember these couple of facts. First of all, most cyber attacks happen by way of an employee. So that kind of sounds like they are the enemy, I understand that. But most of these attacks are not malice. Most of the time what happens is an employee clicks on a link or takes an action that they thought was appropriate, but ends up taking them to a bad location. And unfortunately, just throwing technology at the problem does not mean that you're gonna be able to stop it. If you have a system that doesn't let employees do work, but it keeps them safe, you're in a problem where they can't work. You usually pay for cybersecurity with inconvenience and performance, and people work to get around inconvenient things they don't understand. So let's kind of talk about some of the types of attacks that you have. The first one is phishing attacks. or emails trying to get you to do something. It might be an ad. I have to admit about seven years ago, I clicked on an ad from Amazon, that was for a $5 gift card, it was a cyber attack. Um, even cyber security people make mistakes at time. Whaling is what you'll see a lot of where your boss sends an email, but they'll have made it an actual different email address, but it'll have your boss's name. It might even have his signature at the bottom. And it's done in a way that tries to get you to respond. Go to a website that moves you out of the security of inside of your network. And varshing, that's where you actually get a phone call. I actually had somebody call me up and say they were from the IRS. Now, I ended up messing with this person. I asked them for their badge numbers. IRS agents don't have badge numbers, but he didn't even give me a badge number. He spent the whole time explaining to me how he's not allowed to share his badge number with me. So I knew he was obviously false, but they do. They'll ask you to give $3,000 right there and they'll either give you a bank account or they say they'll come to your house. I'm not sure I'd want them coming to my house, but I will tell you, if you get a call from the IRS, the IRS will send you certified letters. They're not gonna call you. And if they do call you, ask them to send the certified letter because they have to send it in writing. 
Uh, man in the middle attack. This is something I'm actually going to be doing a presentation on international cybersecurity coming up. And the man in the middle of attack has to do with when you're traveling. So you might be at a hotel and you see the hotel Wi-Fi. Well, hackers will set up a Wi-Fi in between that and the hotel, and it'll grab your information. And as you're out there and you're going and you look at your bank account or do other things, they capture all of that information. So that's where they get between you and where you want to go. So you want to be really careful, especially when you're traveling, looking at that. The support scam. This is one that a lot of people get. It might pop up on your screen and have Microsoft say, you have a virus, you have to call this number right away. That is not how Microsoft works. So don't do it, but it will scream. Literally, it'll make a buzzing sound on your computer, some of these. I had one of my clients where they had this happen and they had clicked on the link and got a support technician. They immediately realized what they were doing. They gave me a call. I got in, I saw this technician. I watched what he was doing for a few minutes just to see what he was trying to do. Um, and he was trying to change the registry, which is what runs your computer. So he was trying to do really bad things. I, of course, immediately kicked him out, but they will do that. And if your employees don't know to watch out for it, they'll feel obligated to click on it because it is that panic feeling. Oh my gosh, this is a bad problem. So that's where keeping them informed is so important. And then of course, wire fraud. We have a lot of that. An email will come and it'll say, this is so-and-so customer, I need you to make payments to this bank account and it'll transfer it. We had a client that came to us because all of their payroll had been hijacked. And the person went in, got into their payroll system and changed everybody's accounts so that it went to his bank. So it can be major and it cost them a lot of money and a lot of trouble to fix. So let's talk a little bit about what happens. First of all, poorly trained. You cannot expect your employees to know what to do instinctively. You have to make sure you're keeping them trained and making them part of the solution. That's what you heard called a culture of security. People are gonna do what's the easiest thing they can do their job. So you need to help understand, help them understand why it's so important to protect your company. And don't let employees left to guessing. If an employee has to make two choices, assume they're gonna take the easier choice, which is what hackers give them almost every time. And all of us are busy. So I know if I got 10 emails, when I got that email from Amazon, I was like, oh, cool, I just clicked on it. As soon as I did it, I knew I made a mistake. I have my employees tell me, oh my gosh, I realized I shouldn't have done that too late. The more they're trained, the less likely that will happen in their busy days. And then we add on top of here, working remotely. This has created a new problem that we really didn't have before. And that is a thing where you're working at home, you're connecting on the internet directly, and you're also connecting to your secure network. That is called split tunnel. You go in two different directions. The problem with it is your office computer network has firewalls and all the security. Your home network probably has an AT&T or Sprint router that at best maybe discourages somebody from looking too hard, but anyone that wants to attack you will probably get through it. So one of the things that you wanna do is you wanna not have split tunnels. You don't want traffic going to two places. When they're on your network working, they need to just be in your network. But that again, slows down a lot of people's systems. And so they complain about speed, they try to get around it. These are the types of conversations that you have to have with them. Why it's important that they stay within your network. Any questions? I know I've kind of thrown a lot of information already out there. Any questions anyone has before I move on? Okay, well, let's take a minute and talk about what you can do. First of all, do training. And I'll talk in a little bit about the FTC suggestions for training. But one of the things that I always suggest is don't make it too much. People like to do all day and all week training. I don't retain any of that stuff. I'm sure you guys have the same problem. Smaller, quicker training is better. Have clear and shared policies. So I wanna take a moment and explain. I used to work for a pharmaceutical company. It was a good company, but they had certain policies that they did to meet the FDA requirements. One of those policies had to do with how they backed up. Now, I was only at administrator level. You had to be a director level or higher 
to see this backup policy, but I was supposed to implement it. I had no idea what the policy I was supposed to implement was. So I went out and I figured out my own backup policy. I implemented that backup policy and I just hoped it was like the one that the company required, but I never knew. In the time that I was there, I never found out what the policy I was supposed to be using was. So make sure that the people who need to have the policies can get them and try and make them short and easy. Don't do things like have a 300 page policy book and have a person read this. One, nobody in my company has probably ever read our employee policies. I know I don't. Um, so if there's something that's important to an employee, talk to them. If you have a password policy, make sure that you talk with your employees what it is so they're meeting it. Don't expect them to guess their way through it. And then use technology to support it. Once people understand why they have to go through those extra steps or why it might be a little slower, they'll be more accepting of it instead of trying to find ways around it. And then again, control your remote access. Don't let people in that shouldn't be getting in and then make sure when they're in, they're not also going and doing something else on the side. And then last is passwords, passwords, passwords. Passwords are your first line of defense. You can use multi-factor authentication in addition, but if people get through your passwords, they can get to a lot of things. So don't be foolish with your passwords. So let's kind of talk about training. You wanna have training can be consistent and often. The requirements for certification for like a CMMC is once a year. But let's face it, if you only train somebody on security once a year, they're gonna forget it the other 11 months. They'll retain it for maybe a month and that's it. So instead of doing a big training, do small trainings. So smaller, more frequent. Don't overwhelm people. That's another thing that I'm trying to work with is make sure you do like one thing at a time. Don't throw everything security at somebody. It just is too much. And then one of the things that we suggest is that what we call white hat hacking. It might be email spamming, but instead of going to a malice location, it goes to a training site. Um, when we first implemented this in our own company, we didn't tell the employees. One of the employees did click on it. And that person came back and said, well, why didn't you warn us that you were gonna be doing this? And we explained, well, if we would have warned you, it wouldn't give you the training you needed. We needed to see if you'd click on it so that you can learn what to avoid. So that's a great way. It's an active training environment. We offer that as one of our packages, but there's a lot of good ones out there. So now I wanna actually talk what the FTC suggests. And if you'd like these six tips, we have a form that explains them in depth as well. So first of all, when you're doing training, set a very specific objective for the training. Don't be vague. Don't say we're gonna train cybersecurity. Talk about we're gonna train about phishing. We're gonna train about ransomware. We're gonna train very specific so that people can understand. Remember to keep your audience in mind. You don't wanna be talking at kilobit. You wanna be talking at DC3 encryption if these people are just general workers or something. You wanna keep it within the proper range. If you have a bunch of accountants talking about three days encryption might confuse them. So make sure you know what your audience is. If you're a mixed audience, you should train to the lowest member of the audience. Also remember why they are learning. They're trying to protect your company. What is it they can do to make your company more secure? Control the scope. Again, this is kind of like a specific objective. Don't be everywhere with everything. And last of all, make it a fun experience. Kind of like what I tried to do with the cahoots. Make it something they're engaged. They'll remember it better if they don't feel they have to be stressed about remembering it. Any questions on training? Okay, let's talk a little bit about policies because they are so important. One of the things with policies is it sets a standard that your company can go back to and repeat over and over and over. A lot of times we do cybersecurity by the seat of our pants and we're saying, okay, that's hopefully good enough. But if it's written down and there's a question, you can go back and confirm it. So you wanna make sure you know who the policies affect and then those people are able to read the policies. So I gave you that example of when I worked for a pharmaceutical company, I didn't know if I was ever meeting what I was supposed to do. It was part of my job responsibilities, but it wasn't allowed to be seen. So 
don't have policies, don't make them so that they're so hard to get to, don't put them in a back room, put them someplace where you can easily get to them. And on Technology Partners, we use a SharePoint location to have all of the policies that people need to see. Also, the less an employee has to guess, the more likely they'll do what you want them to do. If you leave an employee up to their own decisions, they may take the wrong road. And it's not that they're trying to hurt you, they just don't know and whatever road feels easy is the way they're gonna go. I can't count the number of times I've had an employee that had something pop up at a client and it says, do you wanna allow this program? And they just say yes, because they're so used to saying yes and not thinking about what it is. So if you let them guess, they'll guess the easiest road, which is what the hackers count on. And be simple and direct. So if you have a password policy, say your password policy is, we require eight characters, complex passwords, changed every 90 days. That only takes about a minute to read. People actually read it. If you have, we at this company believe that passwords are really important. So it is our intention to make sure that everybody has a secure password. You're gonna lose people in the policies. They're not great literature, they're easy and fast. And then let's talk about what we mean by using automated protection. First of all, you should have a spam filter, anti-spam, so that you help remove the temptation. It also helps to protect against things like spoofing attacks. Again, always make sure that everything is up to date. The older it is, the more likely that it'll have vulnerabilities that you can have exploited. You should use a firewall with enhanced security features. Um, if your company is just using the AT&T router, you're probably getting a lot of exposure instead of having that extra level of security. And you should have monitoring on the company devices. So we offer a monitoring package and I've had my team call out to our clients when they see something strange happening. So there's a lot of good monitoring companies out there to help protect you. Again. Yes. Hey Ron, just a quick question on the spam filter piece of sure. things. Um, is there any trends going on right now? I know in some places they, if there's any attachment at all, it's automatically uh, pushed off and you as the recipient have to say that you actually want that to come through. Um, and others take approaches like only certain files are blocked, others can come through. Are there, are there any trends that you see out there or you recommend? So like, and, and we use uh, Proofpoint as our email security. One of the things they do is any links inside of an email get redirected to a Proofpoint scan system. So it'll scan and go six levels deep to see if there's any uh, malice code within the destination. So, like if you sent me the manufacturing cluster link, it would show up as proof point slash a whole series of numbers. And then when I clicked on it, I'd first go through proof point site and then. So that's one of the features to help because links are the biggest way that they get to you. Um, a lot of stuff will scan programs and look for compromised programs. But what they'll try to do is they'll try to have you go to a good website and then in that good website, they'll redirect you to a bad website. Okay. So that has been one of the, so this helps to try and scale down and do a couple of deep dives into that journey. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Yes, Rick. Hey, Ken. Um, just a quick one. Hopefully you can give us a little more background. Um, I know that in many instances, especially for small manufacturers, for that matter, even the large ones, if they want to get insurance or they want to get or, or business insurance or they want to get a loan, they actually have to have security policy in place um, and have to sh prove that. Do you know what are some of the more popular um, NIST, for example, has a, a couple suggested uh, policy based um, uh, systems? Do you have any have anything to give us uh, suggestions there? Um, so you mean as in, so we, we can give a couple of, because CMMC requires policies for everything after maturity level one. So we can help, we have a set, if somebody wants to reach out of policy examples that we can give. Um, if you're even working if you to- don't have, Even if you don't have de uh, um, a defense related contract, um, any general, I guess, any general business requirements now yep. uh, make you, uh, focus on your cybersecurity uh, risk. 
Yeah, and and you should, I recommend, so like I said, CMMC level one doesn't require policies, but I tell all of my clients that are doing it, have policies. Mm-hmm. And we, we, we work with law firms and other organizations to put together policies because what it comes down to is if you don't have a policy, you can't prove that it's what should be done. So you can expect an employee if there is a problem. So you're talking about like cyber insurance. They're going to require that you answer a list of about 25 different things before they will either they'll raise your rates or more likely they just won't give it to you. So if you show that you have policies and procedures, you'll have an easier time getting through that than if you don't. And again, the policies I'd recommend would be very simple. Email use policy, password policy, make them easy. And then usually you define the scope. Who needs it? You might have a policy related to only accounts receivable. If you receive an email that has a change of payment, you should make a call to confirm or something. So you, you want to make, again, policy simple. If they're going for certification, you want to register what certification items you're addressing. But if you don't have that, then you just want to make them straightforward. I have seen so many policy books that sat on a shelf and nobody in the office knew that they even had a policy book. That's not good. And then the other thing you want to do is try and every month go over one or two of the policies with the team. Do you, do you have templates or anything like that? You would. Uh, yes, I, I don't have them. I don't have them right here. I didn't think to bring them. But if people ask, we can give you some of the templates that we have. Sure. And then we also we do sell the uh, more advanced templates for the CMMC type of compliance. But we have some basic templates for how to set up for just your office that we can provide. Perfect. Okay. So I wanted to talk about why you wanna make sure you control access because of what's happening with COVID. And I don't think people are gonna be going back to the office, at least some percentage will not. So you're gonna continue to have this working from home environment. So you have to watch how you control who can get in and where they can get in from. Um, You should have a plan. We're just talking about policies. You should have a remote user policy and you need to explain it to the people that are gonna be working remote. When they get in, they should not be also able to directly access the internet. What file should they be able to get to? And these would be requirements for compliance if you do that. And remember, home networks are not as secure as your office network, hopefully. Hopefully you have more security in your office than you do at a house. If you don't, we should probably work on getting your office security up and then it'll be more secure. So how do you control remote access? First of all, virtual private network. That's a way that everything that's passed between the two locations is encrypted so that other people cannot read it. Um, There's also what are called just general VPNs. So if you go to like a hotel, you can have a VPN that'll encrypt it so that you don't share that information. We can talk about that. That's a little different than a company VPN that takes your data right back to your office. Another thing, if you are out in a hotel, a lot of your phones today come with hotspots capable right on the phone. So instead of using the public access Wi-Fi, use your hotspot. You know it's yours, you know how you get into it, you're not gonna have a man in the middle of attack. And then make sure when people are working remotely, they don't have administrator access to everything. I know giving administrator access makes it easy for people to get to files, but also means that if somebody compromises that person, they get to the same files. So you wanna try and limit what people are able to get to. For example, Office 365 has a great way to do this through Teams. So you set up a team for accounting and only the accounting people can see that. Manufacturing operations gets a different team. That way, if somebody does get in, they don't get to everything. They only get to certain parts of it. So I want to take a minute and kind of talk about passwords because again, for many of us, that is the one and only um, security for our accounts. So the first thing I would suggest is make your passwords complex. And every cybersecurity person will tell you this, but this is the fiery irony about having complex passwords. You can't remember them. And so when you can't remember a password, what do you do? You write it down. 
I can't count the number of times that I've gone into an office and right on the bottom right corner of the monitor is a post-it note with their password. That's not considered secure. When I worked for the pharmaceutical industry, we had way back a lot of rules on what you could do. And I used to walk around everybody's desk, flipped over their keyboards, and there were their passwords. Doesn't do you any good. So when you do have complex passwords, it becomes impossible to remember all of them. I'm not going to remember J61 capital I capital two, or number two pound sign seven A. So what they're recommending now is you use a password management application. We sell LastPass and we use it. And I love it because it's on my phone, it's on my tablet, it's on my computer. But the nice thing about it is you get one really complex password that you put into a safe. I put mine into my Fire safe. And then it keeps track of everything else for you. And mine uses biometrics on my phone. So I have to put my finger to get into it. And again, if I do any major woodworking projects and send off my fingers, I'll never get into anything on my phone again. But it does give you that kind of help that you need. And it can do auto filling and lots of other features. Um, we actually use it in the company and then we can give passwords that need to be shared with the people that need to share it. But you might wanna consider some type of password management. There's some free ones out there as well. This is a big one please don't have your Facebook password and your bank account password be the same password. I'm pretty sure Facebook is not a very secure. In fact, I just saw two more people that I'd known had to tell me that they had gotten hacked on their Facebook. I would suggest doing multi-factor authentication for your social media, but don't share it. Don't make the Bankwood password be the same as your Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter passwords. And don't write your password down on a sticky note on your desk or put it into an Excel spreadsheet that you keep on the desktop. Those are bad practices. Okay, any questions that anybody has? Then I wanna take a minute. Um, I actually got some good news this morning. We have the ability to offer more than two companies between now and the end of September because the CARES Act extended their offer. So we can do about 15 companies, I think, I'd have to check. Uh, but this is 15 hours of free cybersecurity, a $3,800 value, and you get to work with me and my team. So it's a great chance and the government's paying for it. So take advantage of it. Okay, are we ready for another quiz? So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to, give me one second. I just have to change which cahoots we're looking at. Okay, now if you wanna go and go to cahoots.it and type in this pin, we're gonna see everything you've learned from today's session. Okay, we got one. There's two, that's our last time winner. Three, four. There's a few more out there, there we go. RC1 as Jeff. Anyone else? Okay, then we are going to start. Ready, get set. What did you learn about employee cybersecurity today? True or false, employees are the enemy. That's right, employees are the enemy. No, they are not. They better be your and your team because they can do a lot of damage if they're not. Question number two, what is the most effective way to protect your company? Get a big guard dog, train your employees, implement strong technology controls, close your company. 
That's right, train your employees. Technology control is great, but if your employees are actively trying to get around it to do their job, they're gonna undermine all of your work and all that extremely expensive money you spent. Oh, PT is still leading us, but Robert's moving up and Jeff's moving up. Question three, which is a type of cyber attack? Men in the middle, born identity, mugging, grifting. Man in the middle. Now, oh, grifting sounds like it's a good one. Good job, everybody. Jeff's on fire. He's coming up on PT quickly now. Better watch out. What did Ken say is important? Hiding in your basement until technology goes away. Keep your money in your mattress. Passwords, passwords, passwords. Click on everything. It's all safe. I'm a big fan of clicking on everything. Whoever said that, I agree. Well, Jeff's still on fire, but PT's holding the lead. What is a way to control remote access? VPN, burn all devices, don't have employees, never let employees leave. I like that last one. I think I'll tell my team they're never allowed to leave. Oh, look at that. We got that all right together. Good job, everyone. Oh, okay. Six of seven. What is one way to do cyber training? Long, boring training sessions? Singing a little song together? Letting police figure it out? White hat hacking. Good job. This is the last question. How many SBDC 15 hour cybersecurity packages are we offering? One, two, 15, none. This is kind of a lie because of what happened, but we are actually offering a lot more than we had planned on when we started doing this session. So it was originally two. RC1, that must be a password. Robert's number two. And number one, we have PT. Good job. Okay. Whoops. Clicked on the wrong button. Sorry about that, everybody. And we're back. Okay. So here's your chance to win $50. Uh, Joe won yesterday or that was last week already. Wow, time flies. Um, so I'm putting the link to the survey into the uh, chat. If you wanna go and fill out that survey, you have a chance at $50. So free money. I always say take free money. Very good. Thanks, Ken. And probably more than anything, I, I really do hope that uh, the folks that are listening in um, take advantage of the opportunity to get those 15 hours and, and, and you know, verify. We, made, we had some fun with uh, gamification and all, but really a big part of it is just uh, have someone take a look at what you're doing, see if you're going down the right path, see what, you know, sometimes the easiest thing to do is the best thing to do. Uh, see if you've got those things in place. Um, consider that you will be hacked at some point, you know, you will be a recipient of that. And the most important thing is at least have a plan in place that so you can get back to normal, even if it's, you know, later that day or maybe the next day, but uh, you don't want to be left um, unguarded, unprotected. So yep. thank you, Ken, very much. Um, Thanks a lot. We also have uh, on Thursday, we'll be continuing and the last session will be really uh, specific to CMMC. Uh, and it will be a lot more about uh, the certification. The, well, I guess you would say the compliance in certification for those that need one or the other. But uh, we hope that you can join us uh, for that. And that'll round out the three-part series. Any final words, Ken? No, just remember to take it serious, but don't drive yourself crazy. Very good. Thank you very much.